On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Well, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourselves. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And the second part of that will be more in next week because this is a two-part sermon. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today and are just so grateful for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived amongst us and and teaches us so many things that we need to truly understand. This story today, dear Lord, is one of them, that we know what it is we need to do in this life, and that is to love you with all of our heart, mind, strength, and soul. What a glorious life you have given unto us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And when we get to eternity, dear Lord, in glory with you, what a day of rejoicing that certainly will be when we get to see you face to face. Now protect us, dear Heavenly Father, and guide us and lead us and have us do the things you want us to do. For we love you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Testing the scriptures is not wrong as long as you are truly searching for the truth. But if you are attempting to justify yourself by your own interpretation instead of that of Christ, you are in the wrong, no matter how truthful you think you are. In our story today, the question is, what is my obligation to others and to Christ instead of what is my obligation to myself? You see, self is not part of love. You love others, but at the same token, you must understand that it is a two-way street. One person loving is not love without the other being involved. However, we must also see, see that we cannot be the ones putting ourselves in danger without knowing God is truly behind our endeavors. Now, the man that was injured there on the Jericho Road He was uh, being a little foolhardy because that is a dangerous road. It seems obvious that the Good Samaritan traveled this road often as he declares that when he comes back, he will reimburse the innkeeper. Now, we don't know how many people are with the Samaritan or with the man that was injured, but we assume the man that was injured is all by himself there and needing assistance. This road to Jericho from Jerusalem has a name given to it, even in those days and still today. It's called the Bloody Way. The Bloody Way, because robbers and thieves were on this way, and all they would do was grab people, injure them, and take their money. And in fact, even until as late as 1930, it still was known as the Bloody Way. 
There was a man by the name of Abu Jildah. He was very adept at holding up cars who would pass on this road and robbing them as well as tourists. And then he would escape into the hills before the police could show up. Now, I know we must take the word of God to everyone and everywhere without regard to our safety because we see we must be smart about it as well. We must know that this is God's will. We must trust God to care for us. For if he calls us to it, that is to say, if he calls us to it, he will get us through it. Amen. We must know that God is always in control. And if we lose our lives, then that is God's plan. He has a better plan for us in heaven. But if he wants you truly to give someone the glory of his word, to give the glory to someone else, then, my friends, you need to trust God because he will get you through it. Now and again, baseball broadcasters will mention the fabulous career of Christy Mathewson, the amazing pitcher for the New York Giants at the turn of the century. He won 37 games in 1908. Mike, you'll remember it, right? <laughs> Which, Mike, both of you. You were there together to watch that game, weren't you? This remarkable man was admired on and off the field. Of all the stories attributed to Matthewson, the one I appreciate most concerns a highly contested game when Christie was a runner on third base. The manager called for a squeeze bunt, and Matthewson implemented the sign to the best of his ability. The bunt was put down, and he headed for home. Dust and blow home plate. The umpire could not be certain what happened because of the dust. We are told that an unprecedented conference was held between umpires. It was agreed that Christie should make the decision. The fierce competitor walked around home plate, adjusting his trousers, dusting off his uniform, finally removing his cap, and he announced, I am out. He got me. Later in the dressing room, his teammates asked him why he divulged the secret that hurt the team. Whereupon the great athlete, with considerable pride, said, I am an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and I love God, and I cannot lie. Your attention to Jesus Christ and fulfillment of his glory is tantamount to taking the gospel to the world. How much do you love God? Will you sacrifice yourself for the great gospel of God to give it to others? We must do as it said, not as we desire, no matter the consequences to our lives. The gospel of God is much more important than anything that could be given unto us in this life. This man needed to take some special care because of this road. But Jericho was not the problem. The town of Jericho certainly is not the problem. For you see, Zacchaeus, remember the story of little Zacchaeus up in the tree? He was called to live for God in Jericho. The town certainly is not the problem. However, the way to it is the problem. Today, God's not the problem. He is the solution. However, the way to God seems to be the problem to us today. Some say you can get there by this way, or some by that way, or some by such another way, and yet along the way, robbers and thieves are trying to keep us from the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his glory. For you see, we have to stand and walk this road. You cannot substitute for faith in what has been done for things that you think you must do. There's nothing we can do for salvation. We have to trust God for his salvation. Amen. This Pharisee, a lawyer, was attempting to do just that. He was trying to justify himself he was testing Jesus. Now, it's okay to test the word of God to ensure you're doing it right. Remember the Bereans. They studied the word, even Paul's word, to ensure Paul was telling them the truth. And so it's okay to test, but now this lawyer was not testing the scriptures. He was testing to see if Jesus would succumb to the lawyer's 
understanding of salvation. We must know what the Bible says. You must read it daily. You must understand it. And then when someone says, like this lawyer, what must I do to get to heaven? You can tell them that we must have faith in Jesus Christ. We must give him our lives. However, show me your faith without the things you do, and I will show you my faith by what I do, James tells us. If God is for us, my friends, who can be against us? First thing today I want to talk about is the truth of the law. Now often, I think some people think, well, the law is bad and it's no longer in in force uh, because Jesus is the only thing that's good. Well, that's true. Jesus is the only thing that's good. But you guys understand that Abraham came to God long before the law. He came by faith and trust in God. We have the same thing to remember. But let us remember that Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to disband it. In reality, the law has been supplanted by grace. Uh, In our minds, certainly so. But the law is still applicable to show us how to live and how to convict ourselves of sin as well as those that don't know Jesus, how they become convicted of sin and realize they need a Savior. Jesus asked this man of the law, who was going to try and justify himself, a question. What does the book say? What is is written? That's our question today. What does the book say? And too many people say, well, whatever you want it to be, that's true. Your truth is as good as my truth. No, my friends, there is one truth, and that is written down in the Bible, and if you don't read it and don't understand it, then you're the one that's going to pay the penalty. The question was put to Jesus that asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But we find the rich young ruler asking the same question in another story over in Matthew 19, 16 through 17. Now a man came to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Well, why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Do what? Obey the commandments. It's not about knowing the name of Jesus. I know who Jesus is. I know who God is. The question is, do you obey or not? Because unless you obey, you do not know him. Now the Pharisee wants to see if Jesus will be for him and for the Pharisees and to do things as they do them or if he's going to go about business in another way. And as soon as they go, he goes about business another way, of course, what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. What did they ultimately do? They killed him because he would not succumb to their way of understanding the law. In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, it says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. You see, there is but one road, and there is but one gate. And we do not test our Savior in it, We just give him all the glory and obey him. Jesus answers both stories the same. The expert of the law knows the law, but he refuses to know the very fulfillment of the law who's standing right before him. He refuses to see the Son of God because he doesn't need a Savior. He needs someone to tell him that the law is good and that he's good. My friends, I am no good, period. The only reason I can say I am good is because Jesus Christ has made me righteous before the eyes of God. There is no one good, no, not one. Now this command that the lawyer talks about comes from Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands, commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. My friends, I ask you here today and all those watching or listening electronically later on, have you allowed this command to be upon your hearts? It says you must think about the law of God, and the law of God is to love everyone and to love the Son and give him your heart and do his commands. Do you think about that daily? Do you write it on your forehead? Do you put it on your doorpost? Do you get up and talk about it every day? That's what he's telling us. And Because if you do that, you will stand firm in Jesus Christ. We are to tell our children about it. The world has stopped doing that. Just look at our children in the world today. Most of them have no idea who Jesus is and could care less. The only thing they care about is the next game they can get and play on their PlayStation or the next hit they can get by somebody who wants to give them drugs or the next sex party or whatever. That's the only thing that's on their mind. Why? Because our houses today have stopped talking about Jesus Christ. We must give God all the glory from the time you get up to the time you go to bed. Have your Bible open, reading it, and let your kids see you read it. And talk about it when you're at supper. But the thing is, people don't eat supper together anymore. It's amazing what our world has come to. Let's talk about love. That's the point of the sermon today is love itself. Hesed, H-E-S-E-D, is the word most often used for the love of God in the Bible. Hesed truly connotates loyalty unto. God has a great sense of loyalty to us. He has a sense of loyalty to himself. His word is always going to be the same. Every morning, every day in our lives, he does not change his word. He does not say, now there's a new way to heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the narrow gate, and that is Jesus Christ. He is faithful to himself. And yet he loves us so much that he has given us his only begotten son. In Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 9, it says, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was, what was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. My friends, I certainly think we're in that thousands of generations today. And there's many more thousands to come. Until Jesus comes back, God's love for us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He gives us his son that the blood of Jesus Christ might purify us from all unrighteousness. The most quoted verse of the Bible makes true love knowledgeable to us. And how much God loves us. And even how God loves us. From John 3, starting at verse 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. We did not love God before God saved us. God loved us long before he sent his Son into the world to save us. God loves us 
because he chose us, as it said there in Deuteronomy, not because we were more numerous or because we were wonderful, if you want to interpret it there. We, there's nothing good in us. But God chose us because he loved each and every one. He created us in the garden, and he wants us to be with him forever. Loving others is intelligent goodwill unto them. God's intelligent goodwill sent the Son to die in our place. That, my friends, is true love. For to lay down one's life for a friend, that's not unreasonable to us. And yet men do it. How many men on the battlefield have laid down their lives for America? And yet people disrespect my flag every day. My friends, they have died to keep America with free so that men can do whatever they desire, supposedly. But my friends, we need to be doing what God wants us to do, not what we want to do. In Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. What's that word? Love. Hesed, he predestined us to be adopted as his son through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. God truly knows how to love us. He truly knows how to give us the wonders of this world in our hearts and in our minds. He has given us eternal life. What greater gift is there? Love, my friends, is the very basis of grace. Grace, God's redemption at Christ's expense, doesn't say I can earn it. It doesn't say I can do something to keep it. It says, go and do likewise. Go and give God the same love and glory that he gave unto you. We're going to talk about that. We must love all, no matter the national creed, the race, the religion, or the sexual nature of the born. We even have to love the sinner, my friends, because that's how we get them to know the name of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 5, 1 through 2, it says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of what? Love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You need to give up your life to God. You need to give up your very uh, heart, mind, strength, and soul to God. Give him everything that you are because he gave everything to you. The goal of God is love as he teaches us that all things must come to fruition in love as we find in 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Last week I talked about the call to confidence and that I have confidence to answer the Holy of Holies because of the blood put upon my heart, that I am now forgiven, that I can stand before God with confidence, but I also have a sincere heart because of it. I now know that only because of what God has done for me that I can go to God and know that I can do for him because he will assist me in all things. Amen. God desires that all men come to repentance. Therefore, we must work for that end. My heart must be in tune with the knowledge and desire of God. To do that, I must read, I must heed, and I must deed unto all the commands of Christ. I must love in my heart. When I fell in love with my wife, I did so with my heart. I remember that some told Florency that she was crazy, selling all she had here in Florida and moving to Washington State with some guy she'd only known for a few hours in person. We knew each other for a year, media-wise. And I guess she is crazy. She's still with me today. Praise God. Love. 
bind us, bound us together, and love will keep us together, the same as the love of God who came to become our husband. He is, as we the church, are his bride. We must love him as a wife loves her husband. And we must give God all the glory as Jesus gave his father all the glory. Brother Mike talked about the pain that Jesus felt, that Jesus endured, and that he even sweat drops of blood there in the garden because he knew the pain and agony that he was going to have to go through. But yet, my friends, God brought him to it, and God brought him through it. We have an empty tomb today because of the love of Jesus Christ. I must have intelligent goodwill. He tells us in the scriptures that if a friend asks for a fish, we don't give him a snake. If he asks for a piece of bread, we don't throw him a stone. No, my friends, we give intelligently the good things that God has given unto us. I must be true to who I am, yet as I remake who I am into the same heart as that of God. If you're not changing every day to become better acquainted with Jesus, then you need to get a little deeper into the Word. God desires that no man ends up in hell. And my friends, you are his eyes, you are his ears, his hands, his feet, but most of all, you are his mouth. You are there to tell others about the glory of God. We must love God with all of our strength. Have you ever worked so hard for God that you were just wore out? If you haven't, then you're not doing it the way God wants. Your strength must be there for God to work and to glory every day. We must love God with all of our heart. That means that all things that you might love of this world needs to be set aside for the love of God. There's nothing in this world that should take precedence over your love for Jesus Christ. And there's nothing in this world, particularly there's all things are there for us to enjoy. God has given them to us as long as they're not sinful. Enjoy one another. Enjoy the love we have for one another. Enjoy the church. Enjoy reading his word. Enjoy your children. But always give glory to God. If you love God with all of your heart, you will know what to do in all situations. You will know what is right to do, and you will know what God is trying to stymie you from. God says, back off. Or God says, go. I will be with you. You may never see the end result of your witness, but someone else will. You continue to witness. We can only plant and we can only water, the Bible says. God does the growing. Amen. Now, you're also to love God with all your soul. Your soul belongs to God no matter if you give it back to him in obedience or not. All souls in this world belong to God. And on the day of judgment, he will separate those souls. Some will go into the weeping and gnashing of teeth and the eternal flames forever and ever because they did not give their life to God in obedience. But to those of us who obey God to the best of our abilities, with all our strength, with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our soul, we will hear those great words, well done, good and faithful servant, come on in. Amen. How many of you want to hear those words, my friend? Amen. Amen. If you go home to be with the Lord today, will you hear those words? Amen. I want you to know that you will hear those words. The soul is who you are. Too many people are trying to allow the church to be their God. The denomination is not a God, little g. The denomination is there to lead you to God. Do not make the church your God. For Jesus is the head of the church. Amen. And we must give God, the head of the church, all of our lives. 
At our conception, God breathed into our lives a spirit. The spirit and soul are somewhat synonymous. We find the glory of God making us a living entity in Genesis 2, 7. It says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Our soul comes from God. At the moment of conception, a soul is there for eternity. It is not something we can discard, that we can just say, oh, well, a woman has a choice. My friends, the choice happens long before conception. We must give God the glory in all things because every soul is a living being that God wants in heaven. God gave us the lamb. For the blood to apply to our hearts. In Matthew 16, 26, it says, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? You have nothing God wants except your love. You have nothing that you can give to God because God owns everything in the first place. What do you have to give God? Now, elsewhere in the New Testament, we find that the mind in our story today is added to the three that are there in Deuteronomy. I think that is so right to include the mind as our mind must be cleared of the world and do all things in accordance with the glory of Jesus Christ. Men's mind become bent on things that do not belong in our lives. Our minds teach us things that are not taught in the Bible. Our minds accept someone just because they put a Ph.D. after their name. Now, praise God, I wish they all had Ph.D.s, but I just wish that they would teach and preach the Word of God only. We must love our neighbors as ourselves, as we find in Leviticus 19.18, where it comes from. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge. What? Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Amen. We must love our neighbor as we love our own lives. How many of you love yourself to the point where you will give yourself the best instead of go out and give yourself the worst? And does that mean we love ourselves above and beyond anybody else? We certainly don't mistreat ourselves, and if we don't mistreat ourselves, why are you mistreating other people? Just because they look different? Just because they have a different form of religion? As long as they believe in Jesus Christ, we are of the same Father. God is our Father. Amen. The law is good, it says, if it's used properly. That comes from 1 Timothy 1.8. We know that the law is good if one uses it properly. It is not a club to beat people into submission or to beat people into hell because they do not believe as we do. Only one faith, my friends, and that's in Jesus Christ. We give him all the glory. We give him our lives. We give him our heart, our mind, our strength, and our soul. Now the intent of that lawyer that day was to send Jesus to hell because he did not believe the same as this lawyer did. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was his, but his own rejected him. His own said, no, I won't do it your way. And my friends, we only have one way to do it, and that is as Jesus says. He tells us in the Great Commission at the very end that we must teach them to obey all the commands. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. God's with us. Many want to be justified by the church. But my friends, we are only justified by the blood of the Lamb. We must give God your life. You must give him your heart, your mind, your strength, and your soul in love.
If you love him that way, my friends, you will do everything that Jesus desires. Now, this man decided that, oh, this is just a Galilean carpenter. He's pretty stupid. I'll just ask him a few questions that he can't answer. <laughs> you think Jesus can't answer the question? Not only doesn't he know the answer to the question, he knew the question before the man asked it. Did you know that he wrote your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life long before the world was even made? Does that mean you can't, don't need to stand up and give him your life? No, that isn't what it means. He knows that you did or that you will. But give God the glory today because, you see, how many of you are guaranteed tomorrow? I gave him my life back in 71. What a glorious Lord we have. He has taken care of me. He gave me a wonderful wife. He gave me love. He gave me a church to preach in. He gave me a mouth and the ability to preach. But I only know one thing to do with that, and that is to preach the gospel. Amen. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't say the gospel is how someone kneels, what church one goes to. It doesn't say anything else about how we do things. It says we love Jesus Christ with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, and all of our soul. So as the team comes to sing, let's give God the glory today. And if you've been saved, and I think you all have been, but I want you to think for a minute. Have I given God everything? Is there a little compartment in my heart that I just kind of reserve for me? Open that door up and just let it out. Say, God, you can have that too. Because if you give him everything, he's going to give you back so much more. Amen. What a wonderful God we have. You see, he loved you long before we loved him. What a glorious God. It wasn't until I found out he loved me that I truly loved God with all my heart. And so today, as we stand and sing, Giving your whole life today. Mm -hmm.